So good morning, good afternoon everyone. Um, as we've hit the top of the hour, I think we'll make a start with today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining me here today to look at how Service Manager from, from System Center and Microsoft and Saracen can enable good asset management practices. So my name is Davis Mathai. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a solutions architect here with Saracen. In my previous life, I've worked um, with one of the leading UK SAM teams and hope that I can today bring you some of my experiences uh, with SAM and asset management and hopefully you'll find that valuable. And once again, I know that um, all of you are quite busy. So again, I'm very appreciative of you joining me here this morning. But before we start the webinar, just a couple of housekeeping items really quickly. If you have any questions during the webinar, please do post them into the question space in the GoToWebinar applet and we'll come to them at the end of the webinar. We should have about 10 minutes or so at the end for question and answers. If I can't answer anything, um, any of the questions that you do have um, posted, um, I'll try and follow up with you after, after the webinar separately. Um, and finally, I am recording this webinar and uh, in due course over the next couple of days or so, it should be posted up onto our team uh, Cyrus and Vimeo site. So if, if you have any colleagues who wanted to join and couldn't today, um, just point them towards that, uh, that Vimeo site for um, reviewing this presentation once again later on. So a quick look at what we want to cover today. So first off, um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes very shortly just to uh, cover up who is Saracen. Um, I guess most of you have heard of us, but um, there may be a couple of us on, on the webinar who haven't heard or don't know much about Saracen. So a quick background to Saracen. And then I want to set the scene um, and discuss some of the, the goals that we have for asset management and some of the best practices around uh, managing assets. Then we'll talk about what Saracen and Service Manager brings to the asset management party. Um, and one of the biggest challenges I've always found with customers and organizations is, is starting the program. So what I'll talk about is, is a process of building an asset management um, solution and, and, and package of works within your organization. Then we'll discuss how Saracen can support bringing data into your CMDB, uh, which hopefully is Service Manager. And then we'll discuss and show our goals, so Saracen's goals, in bringing IT service and IT asset management practices together. And finally, like I mentioned, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So please do post any questions you have during the webinar into the questions box. So who is Saracen? So Saracen began in 2012, for those of you who don't know us, um, as a consultancy company, uh, being experts in all things system center. But after identifying a few gaps in service manager, especially our usability, uh, while working with clients, we built a few free apps and that's sort of grown. And now we are a fully fledged software uh, software company, an ISV, uh, and a company that helps you and develops apps to help you maximize what you, what you can get out of System Center. So historically, the majority of our apps work on top of Service Manager. But again, hopefully some of you have seen our notifications recently with some of our new solutions for Configuration Manager, especially around the uh, Configuration Manager portal. Um, and also we are extending and working on uh, building additional asset management capabilities through Saracen Asset Management with Service Manager as well as additional solutions where relevant. So again, from a company perspective, we're headquartered in San Diego, um, west coast of the US. Uh, we have over 1,200 customers now across the world. Uh, and across the world means roughly 63 countries uh, globally, and we have over 3 million licensed users of our solutions. We have a small services team, a consultancy team that works in conjunction with our partners to deliver customization and additional services for System Center and, and Saracen. And that team has logged over 43,000 hours of services over the last five years. So again, uh, a depth of experience within that team. Uh, and finally, one of the things that I'm really proud of and really confident in sharing with everyone is the fact that we have a 99% re renewal rate across our customer base, which really does show that we put in a, put in the extra mile um, so that the clients stick with us. So again, hopefully those of you who use us recognize that as well. And al along the bottom of the slide as well, you can see some of our accolades from uh, Inc. 500, uh, which is some of, the, some of the fastest growing companies in the US, through to SaaS software asset, asset management recognition and asset management recognition in general. But if you want to know anything more about those, please do check our website. So let's get stuck into the core of this webinar. So I want to set the scene initially by looking at some of the best practices around asset management. So again, like I mentioned, 
Uh, I used to work in a SAM organization, and this is some of the conversations we used to have very often with customers. So the first and foremost, what are our goals for asset management? So as a business, we generally have service and operational objectives around this. In general, all of us want to reduce some of those negatives within our business, like risk and cost and waste. We want to increase some of those positive things like the agility of, by which we can respond to changes in the business, increasing the value of our assets, uh, maximizing control and consistency of delivery of services. So those are some of the key goals, I guess, from, from a service and operational perspective. <coughs> when done properly, SAM or IT asset management should support these objectives, particularly by enabling cost reduction, cost avoidance, risk reduction, all those key things. As we mature in our asset management practices, we realize further benefits through rationalizing applications and contracts within our estate. So where we've got duplicate software, so different vendors delivering same types of solutions, we should be looking at consolidating them to having fewer vendors, fewer software titles within our estate. When we discover unused assets, we drive optimization through reallocation of these uh, to more relevant resources. So software metering, software usage monitoring is again a way that we can optimize our asset management practices. As we define processes and policies aligned to our business requirements, we enable standardized and repeatable activities. And the delivery of the services becomes more consistent because we have automation and better practices, better processes. Uh, and the key thing, I guess, that we can summarize in all of this is the three traditional SAM drivers that I've seen uh, in my experience. So the first thing we always want to do is reduce costs. So uh, look at our contract com commitments, how much we spend on licenses. We want to reduce that spend as much as possible. I hope you all agree with me on that. Uh, again, unbudgeted spends is also one of the key issues with, with, with people running SAM. Um, so having an audit come up and then without knowing or without without budgeting for it we're suddenly hit with a with a bill for thousands maybe ten thousands or maybe millions of pounds for licenses so cost avoidance is, is another key driver for people adopting software asset management or it asset management in general and finally there are obviously very uh, quite a few risks with not managing our assets pro properly so we want to re reduce and mitigate as much as possible the risks associated with our assets so whether it's compliance being hit with audits um, or having the reputational uh, impact of our organization being fined that kind of thing all of those things are stuff we want to reduce so again hopefully all of you agree with some of these key fundamental points of, of what drives some of the asset management initiatives within businesses. And these are some of the things I've seen um, when working with different organizations. So I mentioned um, asset management maturity in the previous slide. Um, I've worked with this model a lot during my time in a SAM organization. So this is what is called the SAM optimization model, or SOM, SOM, from Microsoft. So again, maybe some of you have heard of that. It describes the stages of SAM or IT asset management maturity from stages initially on the left hand side of so basic and standardized that are, are very um, manual. So you, there's little control, there's little visibility and there's, there's, there's light automation or, or no automation of assets or asset management. And then through to the right hand side where you have a dynamic state where there's a lot of automation and proactive activity for asset management and all stages in between. So you have stages on the left where it's very manual through to the right where it's very dynamic. Now all of this can only be enabled through discovery and definition of policies and processes. So policies and processes underpin our ability to optimize further down the line uh, through automation. So this is a lot of text and maybe you can't read all of this in, 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 in the time, but again, I wouldn't bother reading it too much just to understand some of the key headings. Um, the next slide describes, in, describes it, I hope, for you in a bit more detail. So, or a bit more easy to understand way. So we have a simple graph here with a left-hand axis uh, top to bottom for license quantity and along the bottom we have the deployment status. Now across our application state we'll have various states of deployment and available licenses for any software title or application. So for any given software we'll have a, a, an amount of software, amount deployed, so a number of installs and a number of, a number of licenses that we have. So it fits on one of these lines, uh, the green or the orange line on this chart. <coughs> So the first stage of SAM maturity typically exists where we have either 50% under or over deployment. So we are either 50% under license or 50% over license. So you may be thinking 50% over license is great, so there's no audit risk, but that's all well and good as well. But think of the wasted money. So think about the cost uh, reduction. Imagine licensing 50% of your estate that doesn't exist and the amount of wasted money in that. So that's not a good situation to be in. 
Now, as we increase maturity, so we saw the next stage was standardized. Uh, as we get closer to the center, we have 20% under or over licensed uh, or under or 20% or under or over deployed. And that's the standardized section. And then going closer, we have 10% um, deviation from the optimized. Uh, and that's rationalized. But Nirvana is a crossover point. So the, the point where the, the two lines meet, um, which I guess is, is almost impossible to be across for all of the vendors and software that you have in your estate. But what I have seen is where things are prioritized correctly, so where certain software assets, software titles are prioritized, certain vendors are prioritized, it, it is possible for a few key vendors in software for you to be in this dynamic state of very close to it. So maybe some of you have been through an audit recently, um, and if you've done that on a, on a specific vendor or software recently, where did you fall on this scale? So I'm not going to ask you to uh, do a poll and tell me where you stand on particular vendors. So I'll leave that to you to think about, but hopefully this diagram helps to picture or, or, or show you some of the challenges that you may have in understanding the overall asset lifecycle management of, of the software and hardware that you have within your estate. Whoops, sorry. So we've established that processes and um, policies are foundational to increasing asset management maturity. However, tool sets are also important, so the tools that you use, because um, they can significantly enhance your ability to adhere to the policies and processes. So I just want to spend a few minutes looking at what System Center uh, and Service Manager in particular and Cyrusen can bring to enabling you to uh, enhance your asset management processes. So firstly, let's look at Service Manager. As you all know, it's Microsoft's service test solution. Uh, now, for all its failings, and I know all of you that use it understand some of the pain points that are present, the strength of Service Manager still is its, its, is its extensibility. It's highly extensible, and you can customize and build on that solution significantly. It provides a great baseline to build additional solutions to fit your internal business processes. And this is where Saracen comes in. So as an ISV, so independent software vendor, we provide solutions that extend Service Manager's capability and functionality considerably. But above all, for me, um, Service Manager can be your enterprise CMDB. So Service Manager with Cyrus and especially can help you build this CMDB with asset and configuration item information and especially, more, most importantly, the relationships between these assets and CIs and between each other. So we can represent hardware and software assets within the system using Service Manager and Cyrus and as well as overlay all of the, that rich business and financial data that you have in your organization which is relevant to this. So we've talked about what Cyrus and Asset Manager and, and Service Manager is. So what it is not is it's not a fixed solution of how every organization should be running their software or hardware asset management product, uh, programs. So many organizations will have different key components that they need to focus on. And Cyrus and Asset Management is not a one size fits all out of the box, <clears throat> but rather it's a platform. Um, that gives you 80% of the functionality that you may need for 80% of the organizations out of the box, but then it's also a platform that can be enhanced and customized and modified to fit the custom business requirements that you have within your own, within your own organizations. The other key thing I want to bring up here is CAM, or Cyrus and Asset Management, is not a true up service. So it's not a solution that should be relied on purely from a license management or true up or annual audit perspective. Um, it can show you the majority of your licensing metrics and, and rules, but it doesn't give you the final level of, of detail that you need for uh, an effective license position ELP for a vendor like Microsoft or Adobe or et cetera. So again, don't think of it as a true up service. And finally, it's not a fleet or facilities or plant asset management system. So it's not useful really for maintenance tasks and, and schedules and for using use in manufacturing and, and transport building maintenance, etc. So it's fun, fundamentally an IT asset management solution. People have extended it to take in additional assets, obviously, in the, in the past, but it's uh, but think of it more of, a, of a, as an IT asset management solution as well. So I just want to switch over to my lab quickly. Um, so I'm going to jump in and out of the lab through the presentation just to talk about some of the uh, real life things. So again, those of you who use Service Manager will know um, that Service Manager comes with a connector to con configuration manager. 
configuration manager connector is probably one of the most key ways of bringing data into service manager from an asset perspective out of the box the connector brings in a bunch of uh, records so if I pick up a if I pick up a, um, a hardware asset here this is one I've been working on previously so this is the data that comes out of configuration manager so we have key things like the machine name, uh, serial number, etc., that we can pick up from inventory. Um, and it's good, it shows you some of the relationships to the software, but it doesn't give you the ability to manage the life cycle of the asset. So you don't know what the status of the asset is, you don't know where it is, um, etc. So what Cyrusen does, so once you've overlaid Cyrusen Asset Management within Service Manager, we take the data from computers and software, and we allow you to start creating within this asset management node software and hardware assets. So if I go back into soft, into hardware assets within Cyrusen, find that same device again, through our workflows we take that configuration item or that device that's been discovered and we bring up a, a new form, a new asset for that record. So all of that information that you saw within configuration manager is again showed up within this. But what we do additionally is layer on some of that information that you need to manage that lifecycle of the asset. So things like the status of the asset, so whether it's on order, uh, deployed, in stock, etc., you can start uh, layering on that status. Again, these are list values, enumeration lists, which you can customize to your uh, requirements within your business. Other key thing is I've mentioned it as an IT asset management solution. Uh, again, you want to know the different asset types, so you can start layering on, the, on that information as well. So in this case, this is a laptop, but again, you can take into account your network infrastructure, your servers, data centers, again, all through this asset management system. And then very key information, things like uh, location, where that device is located, who's, uh, which organization is, uh, which is associated with it. You may have the different business units, which cost centers, uh, again, that this uh, asset is allocated to all of these inform all of this information can be overlaid and shown within Cyrus and Asset Management. <clears throat> again, you'll see a couple of things at the bottom. So some of the financial data. So things like uh, warranties and contracts and licenses, support contracts. You may want to show. You probably do want to show for your assets. And in this case, it's very clear to see that this asset has an expired support contract against it or, or a warranty against it and it's very clear to see that the warranty ended up approximately, approximately one, one month ago and we flagged that with a red warning and again that's very easy to see and show within the system we've got the primary user again coming from config manager we can take that relationship data and show that on the asset so again when you start managing that asset through its life cycle whether it's requests being raised against it so someone's reporting an issue uh, or, or Dan P reports an issue, we can automatically allocate this asset as an affected item as part of that process. That's a quick overview of, of a hardware asset. Um, just want to talk about quickly uh, software assets as well. Um, so if I pick up, let's say, this one, Adobe Acrobat 8 Professional. So what we allow you to do with a software asset is ignore a lot of that noise that you get from inventory solutions like SCCM. So we allow you to create an asset with a cleanse name, so in this case Adobe Acrobat Professional, and it's a regional product, so it's a European product in this case, and a version number. Again, we don't care about minor versions because we license the top version. Again, I think you'll all be familiar with that as well. And similarly to the hardware asset, we have the ability to layer in your, your vendor manufacturer information, uh, your location and organization data as well for authorization. And then we have specific to software assets the ability to specify how it's licensed. In this case, we've set it as per seat, and again, you can configure this to your requirements according, according to your contracts. And this is where the intelligence comes in, so the associated software section. <coughs> Within this, I'm saying that anything in discovery with Adobe Acrobat 8% is a wildcard. So we have any anything else and professional with percent, again, another wildcard, we associate with this hardware asset. And then any version outside of 8, so 8.1, .2, whatever, we again wrap them up into this one top level software, software asset. We can also set additional licensing modes. By default, we say one discovered installation equals one license. But if you had additional licensing metrics, this is where you would specify the ability to license it in, in another way. And again, this is probably where the biggest limitation of, of the software asset management piece within SARS asset management falls in because we don't have the biggest repository of licensing metrics. But again, it gets you 80% or 90% of the way there. And then linking into your licenses and contracts, we can start look, working out purchase counts. So you can see this is all grayed out, so I can't manually edit this. This is taken from your licenses that you've uploaded. 
and again from discovery data we can see installed count so we can see uh, a spare license count of 47 so again that, that calculation is done automatically and if I go into related assets you'll quickly see this shows me all of the, the machines the three machines that it's been discovered on and these are the different versions of Adobe Acrobat 8 that have been discovered within the estate so all of these different versions have been wrapped up into this one top level asset so again it's very easy very powerful to show you the ability to manage that asset in a way that you want to manage it so you don't care about all the different versions from a licensing perspective you care about the top level version and you want to relate all of your discovered resources to that one one software asset hopefully that's been clear and that makes sense and you can see some of the ways that Cyrus Asset Management allows you to manage that life cycle of the asset whether it's software or hardware So moving on, um, one of the biggest challenges people have, as I've seen when I've been working in, in the SAM industry, is understanding where to start. So there's often in every organization a lot of data within different solutions and understanding where to start your asset management program is, is a big challenge. And this is probably one of the key areas where it is a challenge, so number of software titles in, in your organization. So let's build that slide out. So if any of you have done an export of the installation data in Configuration Manager or, or any other inventory solution that you may have, <clears throat> do you remember how many applications or pieces of software you found? I can almost guarantee that it wasn't the first two options or under 500. So in my experience, um, working with customers with 2,500 to 5,000 computers, and especially those that give local administration, uh, administrator access to their end users, Typically, those organizations have upwards of 10,000 unique applications discovered. And this could be unique names, unique versions, etc. in the data set. Now, a lot of this data will be noise, so things like hot fixes, freeware, uh, things that you don't really care about, you don't want to manage. But it does demonstrate the challenge, the key challenge in seeing the wood for the tree. So you look at a lot of data and you don't know where to start with that data. So what I'm going to talk about is, is a quick look at the journey that I recommend, that I've worked with customers on, to uh, setting up your SAM program and also working through it. Um, and it's probably a, a long-term objective. So some of these processes that we've run through with customers has, have taken two, three years, um, and it's a two, three-year program that you have to put in place, but it's worth it over the, lo the long run. So when I, when I worked in the SAM world, as I said, uh, we've talked about the stage approach, this phased approach to asset management optimization. So before starting to do stuff, so just getting in getting in and removing software or or working out like software counts, etc., always take take stock of understanding your current state. So this is a discovery phase. Look at your software software estate, look at your data sources, look at your hardware estate, understand your tool sets that you have for discovery and other data sets that you may have within your organization. And most importantly, understand the gaps in the data and the knowledge that you have. So key also in this phase is discovering what your business goals are and your strategy is. After you've done the discovery piece, the thing you need to do is assess your current state, so what you've discovered, against your goals and aims that you've also discovered in the first phase. Then once you have, have all of that, design the future state in the, in, in the envisioning phase, so the third phase. Modernization is where I talk about implementing those changes, so things you've designed, deploy those new solutions, processes, policies in the modernization phase. And finally, we have the management phase. So this is your ongoing business as usual activities where you employ the controls that you've designed to ensure that you don't, that the modernized state that you've achieved doesn't start deviating to, to a problem state very quickly. So we've all, I think, um, I don't know if you've, you guys have experienced it, but in my experience, if you do a point in time audit with a customer, so you get to a point where you understand the current position, you cleanse your, your data set, but if you don't have the processes and, and the, the way to manage the current state very quickly, the software sprawl starts again. So people request software, they get software installed without any approvals, and then that situation becomes back to where it was before the audit very quickly. <clears throat> so all of this, this process should cover your entire state. So firstly looking at your compute environment, so your infrastructure, your software, um, your workloads from, uh, from an IT perspective. It should also contain your contracts, your business assets such as contracts and licenses. And as I've already mentioned, also take into account your business and IT processes, your key performance indicators and also your goals for your business strategy. So all of these things are very key to developing and building this asset management 
practice. And again, like I said, it could be a long-term objective. It could take months, years uh, to achieve. And again, focus on specific vendors, specific software titles, because if you look at every single software title that you have within your estate, um, it can be uh, a nightmare to get started. So look at uh, vendors that you spend the most money on, software that you have the most in installs on, uh, and uh, start working from that perspective uh, to build up the process of managing your assets through, through their life cycle. Now, every data set for inventory against your estate will have gaps. It's guaranteed. I've never worked with a customer that's provided a data set which covers every single one of the devices. But the first thing you want to do is make sure that you have your target list as accurate as possible. So there is no point in trying to get inventory of a machine that hasn't been online for two years, as an example. So not even the vendors care about that. Um, so don't bother with those devices. So what I've always told customers who've had to supply inventory data for a license review is, firstly, export your computer records from Active Directory. So again, you may be thinking, there's a lot of rubbish in my AD, we don't clean it up. Take that list, filter against the machines that have authenticated against AD in the last 90 days. That's what auditors really care about. Uh, and then that will give you a list of your active machines. So you filter for the 90, last 90 days, and then what you should have is once you've got um, your active machines, the target should then be to have inventory from at least 90% of those devices. Uh, so again, that's what auditors typically look for when you're looking for running a running a, a license position. So again, filter by the list, uh, by the, uh, the the total list of, in AD for active dev devices and target those for inventory. Now, you may be thinking that your inventory solution, so you may be running Configuration Manager or Alterius or Landes, so SECM may not have 100% coverage. Again, that's a fair point. So it may be challenging also in the, in the audit timelines to get that coverage very quickly. So what you could look at is agentless inventory solutions, and that can be a great way to supplement the data that you have very quickly. So I've used the MAP toolkit, so Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit, extensively with clients when working on SAM engagements. And the key benefit of this is it's free. Um, but it also has the ability to gather a lot of data that you wouldn't have uh, beforehand. So another key inventory gap that I've found with customers is the data center. Uh, and again, that's probably where we spend the majority of our license expenditure. Uh, and often, if you've got SCCM, you may not have SCCM on the servers from a licensing perspective because SCCM licensing for the server estate is much more expensive potentially. So Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit, so MAP, provides proves very useful here as well as you can get both the inventory of logical servers so uh, whether they're physical or virtual as well as inventory of your virtualization environment so even including VMware so not just Hyper-V. So this leads me to my final point which is understanding the VM to host relationships to your guest to your host relationships in your VMware or Hyper-V environments is going to be critical to understand your licensing of server applications. So wherever possible, you should you, you should try and represent this within your CMDB. So okay, we all know, I hope, that uh, Service Manager has a connected to it. Config Manager, so you can bring your inventory data in from Config Manager. But what if you have the data now in Map, or you have it in, in another data set? How do you bring that data into the system? So hopefully this is where um, Cyrus can come in. So the ability to bring in various data sets or various data, various data sources is a very important requirement in my, in my understanding, my belief for an enterprise CMDB. So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that just now. As I've mentioned uh, in this, uh, this presentation already, most organizations have a configuration management or an inventory solution within their estates. So I've talked about config manager, land desk, Alterius. If you look at the inventory data within that and the reports that you can pull from these systems, you will see a wealth of information captured by all of these. But the thing that we find in most organizations is that data in these systems is used reactively. So when an asset manager wants to do an audit or uh, they want to see uh, an installation count across the estate. The other thing to mention is the inventory in these systems when you run the reports is point in time. So it's for accurate in a specific point in time. And it doesn't capture the changes to the asset over its life cycle. So you're not looking at what changes has the asset uh, had, who's, who has it been allocated to in the past, what statuses has it been in, how long is the warranty for. All of those things are not captured by this inventory and config manager. 
So by taking that data and bringing it into, con into service manager and Cyrus and asset management, we can start to see trends of certain values, like the number of installs of a software application, number of uh, models of a certain laptop, etc. And we can start associating other data to give us a more complete picture of what our organization looks like. Things like services, where application servers are related to SQL servers, which are related to web servers, all these things. And then we can build up a picture of the, of the estate. The third step, which is very important, again, in my experience, is, is knowledge. So we all have a lot of knowledge within our resources, within our people in IT or within the business. That knowledge, if it's just in people's heads or in different documents and different file shares, again, is not very useful and not very uh, easy to access uh, when you need it. So the, the, the system that you use to manage your assets ideally should be able to take in some knowledge documents for those assets as well. And for me, all of these three things together, and there are other things obviously, constitute the uh, key parts of a CMDB, uh, the configuration management database. So for example, uh, with just the config manager or the SCCM data, we can see the number of installs of a particular application. But if we combine that with cost center data, depart departmental data, usage information, costs, uh, support, some war support data, warranty data, etc. We can quickly get to the information that we need from many different directions. So, if a manager wants to know what they need to budget for, if they increase staff in a particular job role, what is it going to cost him from a software license perspective? By using the cost center information in Service Manager in Cyrusen, the manager can easily look and track which software is associated with the cost center, what the cost of that software is divided by the number of users in that cost center, and that gives you a cost per user for that cost center. And again, that's very powerful to have as, as, a, as a data set, and it's pretty easy to do when you have uh, the data within your CMDB. So, oops, I shouldn't have moved on there. Um, what I want to do is just switch over to my lab again, and uh, we've looked at quickly uh, hardware and software assets. Let's close that off. What I want to do is talk about importing data into the system. So there's a couple of methods we I want to discuss here. Um, firstly, the connector method. So out of the box, again, service manager ships with uh, connectors to AD, configuration manager, ops manager from an alert, an alert perspective and a CI configuration item perspective, orchestrator to bring in your run books to enable workflow and automation, and also uh, VMM, virtual machine manager, to bring in your virtual, virtualization data virtual machine data even. What we as Cyrus and add on top of that with Cyrus and Asset Management is the Asset Management Import Connector. So I'm just going to run this now to show you how we can work with this. I'm going to link into a management pack. This is not very uh, important for you to see right now. But we've got a couple of or a few methods of bringing in data. I'm going to run uh, a CSV file to bring in the, uh, to show you how to bring in data. So I'm going to bring in some hardware assets in this case. Point it to my hardware asset CSV. I also have the ability or the option to connect to an SQL database, so I can type a connection string, type an SQL query, and bring in data from another data set. So if you've got a SQL database for your CRM, HR, whatever, and you want to bring in data from there, your procurement system potentially, uh, you, may, you can do that if it's running SQL. If you can connect into another uh, database uh, it, type, uh, as long as you can run some SQL query and you can connect using ODBC, you can bring in that data as well. And finally, if you want to supplement your, your AD data with additional customized data, you can run custom LDAP queries against your AD to bring in that data as well. But let's run with the CSV file for now. The next thing you do is select the class. So there's a multitude of classes. Um, let's go full screen just to hopefully give you a full view of this. Um, so I know this is a hardware asset. Spreadsheets. So I'm going to map it against my hardware asset class. If it was a if it was a licensing spreadsheet, I could map it against the license class. So that's how you can start mapping the data. But I'm going to map it against hardware assets in this case. I can also bring in relationships. In this case, I'm going to bring in the full relationship structure just to show you what it looks like. And then if I go to next, this is where it's really powerful. So on the left hand side, you see all of the properties against that class. So in this case, the hardware asset class has all of these properties against it. On the right hand side are the column headings in my CSV file or the column headings for my SQL query results as an example. So in this case my CSV file has these column headings and I can just start mapping the column headings to the properties in this UI, so this GUI in the environment. So display name is asset name, asset ID is uh, serial number asset ID. Now these are the two properties that are mandatory, they are required. 
Everything else is optional. If I have the data, I can map them. If I don't have the data, I don't have to map them. Um, so I can uh, go through that process. Additionally, at the bottom, I have the ability to map relationships. So if my CSV file has vendor information, sort of vendor for that hardware asset, I can map that. And I can map it directly to the vendor uh, class within the database. So again, managing those relationships at the import phase can be extremely powerful. And the best part of any connector is the ability to schedule. So I can run this connector. So imagine if it was connecting to your procurement system, you can set it to run weekly, monthly, whatever, to bring that data into, into the CMDB, and you can have a current set of data and always updated set of data within the database. So again, very powerful. So hopefully you found that interesting. The other option that we have is an application that we've developed for Excel. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, I've got an add-in into my Excel installation. I can hit the connect button and this uses an API connection into Service Manager to bring in uh, or, or add functionality into my Excel. So it uses my login to connect into Service Manager. So based on my access rights, I can see the different bits that I can see. And also I don't need a Service Manager console present to run this. So what I can do is, at this point, I can bring in all of my hardware assets, search for them, bring in, uh, hit the search button and it creates a new sheet for me, bringing in all of the hardware asset data that I have within my database into this spreadsheet. And you can, you can see it's nicely formatted. It's very easy to use, um, very clear to see. <coughs> Any items that are list values within Service Manager, so enumeration lists, they're lists within Excel. So easy to use again, so we control the, the fields that you can enter. But obviously one of the greatest features of, of, of Excel is the ability to bulk edit uh, columns. So I can say all of these devices are actually deployed, change that status, and then because these are selected, I can hit import asset hardware assets, and that goes and changes all of those hardware assets to deployed within the database, and it's very easy. And you can see how quickly that was done, and it's, again, controlled within uh, Excel and uh, managed through the database. So the real benefit of this is, I guess, asset managers historically are used to working in Excel, and that is a, a very easy solution for most of us to understand and work with. So what we say is con continue using Excel, but we control where the data sits. It's not in different spreadsheets and different file shares in different locations. It's uh, in a central location, central database that's managed by, uh, by, by you uh, within the system. And similarly, if I wanted to manage invoices or licenses in this case, click on the licenses button, all the licenses within the database are brought in. Uh, I can make whatever changes I want again. Move over to the right, and in this case, hit the update button, and it goes back to the service manager database and updates all the records. So those are two methods that we uh, provide as Sarison to bring in data into your CMDB, the CMDB being service manager. So we have the uh, asset import connector, as well as the asset Excel application. So again, hopefully you found that useful. So for me, the biggest win is integrating IT asset management with service management. This is where organizations can start moving towards that right of the maturity scale. So we talked about dynamic and standardized and rationalized. So moving to the rationalized and standardized models or, 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 or uh, maturity levels um, is possible through integrating service and asset management together. So. This is, again, something that I've presented on many times in the past uh, in, in, in my previous SAM life. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is something that we can discuss in, in extreme detail. Uh, it's not the scope of this presentation today. But it's just to further set the scene. So we mentioned previously, and again, hopefully you've, uh, you've uh, resonated with that and you understand that, that processes and policies uh, under, underpin everything that you do in SAM or IT, IT asset management. So SAM in itself consists of many several processes. So for me, they can be split into a bunch of primary processes so along the center. Uh, you see those four key primary processes, and those are all supported with supplementary processes that hang off the sides of those. So evaluating each sub-process within these can be a huge task. And uh, like I said, this presentation isn't about how to do that. But if you think about a software, software's lifecycle, it starts at the point of someone requesting it, correct? 
So when IT service management is not integrated with IT asset management, how can you properly manage that first really important step? So if someone wants to uh, request a really expensive piece of software, and if you have no approval processes or you have no checks or, or no ability to make sure if that user actually is entitled to it, if you have none of those processes in place, those that person is just going to request it anyway. It's human nature, right? So we're going to request whatever we want. So we often talk about software metering or software usage monitoring being a device or an ability or a capability to manage software sprawl and reclaim licenses, and that's 100% true, by the way, and it's uh, it's 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 a great solution. But for me, that's really reactive. That's after the after the fact. After you've got a um, unmanaged software state, it's bringing that back into control. But if you integrate service and asset management together the, at the request stage, so at the first stage of the process, you can prevent that software sprawl or that that, that uh, deployment issue of, of software across the estate. You can prevent that in the first place. You can control that in the first place. And because this uh, this uh, gr this chart is on or this diagram is on, on on the screen, just for reference, each process mentioned here or each sub process even has a bunch of sub processes within them itself. So. And those can vary within organizations. So it depends on your processes, depends on your policies, depends on your organization structure, etc. But what I want to do next is just look at a, a real-world example of how you could potentially look at a process for uh, requesting and managing that request of software. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty basic, but also quite powerful. And it's stuff that our consultants work with customers all the time to deliver. So if we look at the process of, of wanting software, everyone starts the process of someone wanting something, right? So then how do you capture that request? So you have a request form, hopefully that's electronic, so you can capture all the data electronically and not a, a piece of paper, which would be uh, not very optimal, let's say. So once you've captured the request from the end user, you should have some level of approval. So does that software need approval to go onto that end user's device or be provided to that end user? If that software does need approval, does that software need purchase? Do we have spare licenses? If not, do we need to buy some uh, additional licenses or software? And if it does need purchasing, then again, there's probably another approval process because someone needs to authorize that purchase. And then, that purchase should be approved or rejected. If it's rejected, then the whole process stops and the end users notify that they can't have that software. If that uh, approval is uh, approved, let's say, it's, if it's a yes to buy that software, then we send that software to the client, hopefully via some electronic means like Configuration Manager. And once we've deployed the software, we've got the status back that's been installed, that process or this request process ends again. Then let's go back to that first approval. Um, so if that software doesn't need approval to go into that user device, then what we should do is then jump straight into the deployment piece and go to configuration manager, send the software to the end user, and the end process uh, completes as well. So again, a very simple uh, diagrammatic way of looking at that request process. And uh, all of those steps in, in between, so from start to end, can be manual, so you can do the approval, approvals manually, the purchasing manually, uh, sending the software in Configuration Manager, again, as a, as a manual step, so someone jumps into the con Config Manager console, does a deployment, etc. Or you can start working on automating all of these steps. But the key thing for me is having that first software request form, the ability to capture all that information correctly and present the right types of assets to that end user is going to be vital for this whole process, so whether you employ manual process or automation. And I just want to talk about a way of doing that. So if I just switch back on into the lab, let's close this off. So one of the key solutions that we provide for our customers is a web portal into Service Manager. So that web portal includes both a, a self-service element for the end user as well as uh, an analyst experience where you can manage all of your work items, your tickets through a web interface as well as all of your assets, which I'll touch on in a second. So this is the PS the resistance, I guess, of our solution. So the web portal of, of, of Service Manager from Saracen. So the home page, uh, in this home page, in my lab, I've got a bunch of request offerings that I've published to this end user. What I want to talk about in this case is requesting an asset. So 
I've got a through Saracen's uh, advanced request offering uh, application. I have the ability to create really dynamic request forms. I have the ability to request this service or this asset on behalf of someone else. So I can say I want to request this on behalf of, I don't know, uh, let's say a guy called Chris J. Search for him, find him. I'm going to request this on behalf of Chris. From my asset management database, I have a bunch of catalog items. So in this, I have taken a, a bunch of catalog items, uh, a subset of that list. So I've got a few phones and a few laptops available for selection in this asset request. If I choose a phone, I have the ability to either choose a case and then I have to give uh, an approval uh, or, or a manager approval, uh, choose a manager for my approval process to kick in as well. If I choose a, a laptop in this case, if I'm requesting a laptop, let's say I'm choosing this laptop, you can see the options have changed underneath. So in this case, I need to give, when do I need it by? Let's say 30th of July. Do I need a docking station rather than a case? So I'm going to select that. And then what I've also done is connected into my asset management database and shown my software assets that are available for selection. So again, you can show the bits that you want to show. In this case, I'm showing available licenses, the cost, where it's present within the database, and whether it's free software. So in this case, I've got a few items with costs associated with them, and I'm showing them to the end user. So you may not want to do that. You may not want to show the end user, user the number of licenses. You might want to do that process in the background. Again, you can do that. That depends totally on your processes and your requirements. So in this case, I can go ahead and choose the software that I want. So I want this one. I want to choose all of the expensive software because I'm like that. Uh, I'm going to go and select those, go through the list, and then see if there's anything else I want. So uh, go and choose everything that I can find. And then I've got the full list of software that I have available to me on Google Chrome. Then I'm going to choose my manager. Uh, let's say I can, ch I can filter and search by any of these column headings. So it's really powerful. So I can say search for IT. Uh, so let's say I work in IT. And it filters the list down. And this is my manager, let's say. Hit save. It then goes, uh, goes ahead and creates a service request within the system. So once it's created, I'm just going to show you what the service request looks like. You'll, you, you'll see on the form, or you, you'll remember that on the form, I had no free text fields. So the free text fields are one of the biggest pains that I see from a request process. If you give end users free text field, you have no control over what they put into that free text field. And you have then potentially the, uh, the case where you have to go back to the user to get clarification on exactly what they want. But if you present to them exactly the type of items that you have available for, for, for deployment or, or from your service catalog, you can make that process of, of requesting and deployment much more simple. So here you can see I've collected all the information I wanted clearly in my description field. If I go to my related items, because it's all items from my catalog item list or configuration item list, as well as uh, catalog items and software assets, I can relate those to, to the request form. And again, because these are specific items, configuration items, I can then automate deployment potentially of these using orchestrator, using config manager, any other workflow solution that you may have. So again, all of those things are related to this, uh, to this record. So again, very easy for me to capture that request and the request piece. I know exactly what the end user needs. I can then initiate the process for checking uh, the licenses, etc. For any service request template within Service Manager, you can set up activities to run through a process whereby that service request has to go through before it becomes complete. So in this case, I've got a, I've got a two-step process, which is very basic. You may you can make it a much more complex process. So in this process, I've got one for approving a step for approving that request and a step for for applying that service, so deploying that software. You can have multiple approval steps. You can have multiple deployment steps. You can have steps that run concurrently, so one runs in conjunction with another. So you may have a, a process for buying the software and also packaging the software if that's needed. Or you can have uh, you can have sequential activities where one has to finish before the next one starts. So all of these uh, processes are, are, are all these workflows are customizable, and and you can set these up within the templates within Service Manager. So again, a very powerful solution for you to manage that request process and control how people get assets. And I also mentioned that you can manage assets through this web portal as well. So just to go back to the search, this is the asset that we were looking in within the console, and I can click on that, find it, click on it, and then I can manage that asset through the web portal as well. So I have the access to all of the fields that I have within the console. I can manage all of the items in here. I've got all of the tasks that I had before. I can see all the finance data, related items, etc. 
So this is the ticket that was raised against his device. And again, I can see that in this list. So it's very powerful from a relational, relational perspective, service manager in Cyrus and allows you to have a, an enterprise CMDB effectively that gives you the ability to see all of the key bits of information you want to see against those assets. So hopefully you found that demonstration uh, useful as well. So just switching back to the slide deck, we're coming to the end of the presentation. I know we're getting close to the end of, of, of the hour as well, so I hope you can bear with me for a few more minutes while I finish a couple more slides. Um, just going to let this build out so we can talk through this quickly. <clears throat> There's a couple of or a few administrative tasks that you should think about when you're managing assets through Service Manager. Um, so the, we talked about um, warranty contract license end dates key thing you can do with that is set up notification events so you want to be notified when a contract is coming up for renewal or a warranty is coming up to expiry so you can set up notifications within service manager use them because it's available and it can significantly improve your life uh, in terms of monitoring what's coming up for renewal that kind of thing the other thing key recommendation or, or task that you should do is run regular reports <clears throat> look at things like under subscribed assets so if you've got and oversupply of licenses, is there opportunity to reduce your costs in, in that area? I didn't touch on the connector, but we have a connector into Config Manager to bring in software metering data. If you have Config Manager, Cyrus, and then Service Manager, I would recommend you use that connector because you can bring in usage information that you've con configured in Config Manager and associate them with your software assets. So you can track usage through Service Manager as well. Run the relevant report so you then, then you can see where you can have the opportunity to reclaim licenses. <coughs> Don't wait for an audit or a true up event to run your own audits. So depending on the vendors or the software that you're managing, think of the cost of the software, think of the installation base. Run your own internal audits every so often. Again, that depends on the how the frequency depends on uh, the, the vendor, the, the cost, etc. But again, try and do that for your top vendors and your top software products uh, quite frequently. Make sure you manage the status of assets, so retire assets, add additional assets as you discover them. Um, where you've got gaps, run that manual inventory as, as often as possible so you can keep track of, of what's happening with those assets and, and, and make sure you're keeping track of what's happening to each of your assets within the system. So there is some ad, admin uh, involved in this. And then finally, we've talked about automation, keeping a track of your processes and, and your, your assets through the through its lifecycle can sort of bring, a, bring, bring about or enable you to see where you can automate some of these processes. So automation is, is, is great, and I think we all understand some of the benefits of automation. You don't have to keep doing the re re repetitive tasks manually. Um, you can free up effort um, for yourself or others so that they can focus on additional, more value-added activity. You can ensure um, re repeated tasks are delivered in the same way every time. So some of the key benefits of automation I think all of you know about anyway. So again, having a constant view of your assets can identify those automation opportunities all the time. <clears throat> so that's uh, everything I wanted to present today on Cyrusen Asset Management. Um, just uh, one slide to finish on, on uh, just to give you uh, uh, an overview of, of, the, of the community. So Cyrusen has a, we have a community website. It's a web forum for you to, <clears throat> you can ask questions of industry experts, Cyrusen employees, uh, other customers, etc. You can post questions. Uh, we have different sections for all of our software products, as well as sections for system center solutions. You can post feature requests on Cyrus and products. You can vote other feature requests that you found. And we do take those into account when, when building our roadmap. So if you don't have access to the community, please do register, join in uh, the conversation. It would be great to see you on the community site. So please do continue posting your questions. just want to give you a couple of uh, resources just to show you the resources for this for this uh, webinar. So uh, the webinar recording will be found on uh, on the Vimeo site, so vimeo.com slash Team Saracen. Uh, community site again, https community.saracen.com. For more information on the Saracen platform, visit uh, saracen.com, obviously. And um, if you have support on any of the solutions, again, support.saracen.com, please do use that to raise any issues questions that you have with any of the solutions that you have uh, support issues with. If you do want to just get in touch with us, you want to post any questions or share any uh, advice, tidbits or whatever, 
team at saracen.com is, is probably the best way to get in touch with us. Just email that uh, address and someone from the, the, the most relevant region will reach out to you and, and get back to you. And finally, for any of you who are interested, we have a couple of online and classroom-based training sessions coming up. So the, the classroom-based training uh, is going to be in London. Uh, so if you're interested, please do get in touch. The training is scheduled for September, so middle of September. Uh, the dates are to be finalized, but if you're, you are interested, again, get in touch with team at sarison.com or email me directly. Um, so yeah, again, if that's of interest, please do get in touch. So with that said, there's a few minutes for questions, uh, if you do have any. I'm just going to look at the questions box to see if there's anything in there right now. So there's no questions in the question box so far. Uh, I can't have been that clear, so if you do have any questions, please do post them. Um, I'd be happy to try and answer anything that you do have. Obviously, if you don't have any questions, uh, please do feel free to drop off. And again, once again, thank you so much for making the time this morning to join me on this webinar, uh, and I hope you find it useful. So any questions, again, please do post them into the questions box.